most of uh, most of the kind of work that we do is based on uh, specimens. Specimens are in the field, so uh, the collections have a great wealth of, of data in them. But it's really important to get out and see, first of all, where they occur, and also get fresh material. A lot of the material I use, I do molecular work with, and unless we get fresh material, we can't do the work. You never know what to expect to find in the tropics, but uh, um, the three main families that I work on, I'm, I'm hoping to get lots of specimens of each uh, for the work uh, that I'm doing. Um, I mean, outside of my main research groups, there's always exciting things to find. We're just tearing open an ant nest and looking at uh, some of the groups I don't even work on in the, in the ants, some of the forwards and things attacking the ants. It's, it's pretty cool. Every family of flies has their own, uh, their own sort of place, and uh, so I'd have to sort of answer that group by group. But the, for example, pipe and keel, eight big-headed flies that I work on, they're really edge creatures. They like to be along um, edges of forest. So this morning I collected some off of this shrub here. Um, they, they'll be along creeks, anywhere there's sunny patches and openings, uh, tree falls. So I've been looking, concentrating on a lot of that. Uh, in the same habitat as that, you get a lot of flower flies, surfidae. Um, they really are, are sun creatures. They're pollinators, uh, so a lot of them go to flowers. We're not seeing a lot of flowers this trip, so it's, it's uh, tricky to find them. But in the sunny patches in the morning, flies are morning creatures. Um, we see them. In the afternoons, not so much. And then the third family I work on, uh, Canopidae. Uh, one big group of them are flower visitors and another group are uh, following army ants, and so find the army ants and you find those flies. I typically use an aerial net and uh, seek them out. So uh, traps work. There are lots of different traps. Malaise traps, the most productive for all three of those families of flies. Uh, but there are some, particularly some of the surfidae, the flower flies, that uh, the, uh, they're very good at getting in and out of traps. So you have to hand collect those, for sure. And uh, you see huge biases between traps and hand collecting. I collect mostly males, so the big-headed flies I collected off this shrub this morning were all males. Uh, a trap will collect mostly females. And that's probably because the females are covering a lot more ground, looking for their hosts, and end up in the traps. And the males tend to stake out little patches, and the females go to them when they're interested in mating. Again, group by group varies, so one of the reasons I like to work on more than one family of flies is because of that. So big-headed flies that I started my uh, career on, uh, you have to uh, remove the abdomen, uh, macerate the abdomen in lactic acid, so heat it up in lactic acid, which clears it, and then look at the genitalia. So I spent all day looking at fly genitalia. And then when I'm tired of that, then I work on surfidae which 75-80% uh, of them I can identify uh, without dissection and uh, many of them at, you know, at arm's length. They're quite distinctive, a lot of the species. So it really depends what I'm looking at. Um, the ones I was just picking up, the canopids that are following the army ants, uh, are really dimorphic. The females are totally different than the males. And in that case, um, it's really tricky identifying them. The males, uh, you can look at genitalia, as well as bristles and other external characters. And the females you can identify, but figuring out who belongs to who is, is a real trick with those and big-headed flies. Their um, males and females are different. And so in that case, you either have to find them mating to be able to figure out what the same uh, males and females are the same species are, or look at the DNA and, and map them out that way. Yeah, so all three families I work on are, are distributed globally. They're on all continents except Antarctica. Um, canopids really are semi-arid habitat specialists other than these army ant followers. So I wouldn't expect to get many uh, thick-headed flies, canopidae, in, in the rainforest other than the army ant followers. Um, if you go to the southwestern United States or arid, uh, semi-arid parts of Africa or Australia, the canopidae are abundant uh, pollinators, and, and uh, they're also um, uh, parasitoids of bees. I'll talk about that more later. But uh, um, so they're they're different. Uh, Big-headed flies and surfids, flower flies, 
are uh, they like more mesic habitats, wetter, wetter forests. And so they're abundant in rainforests, they're very common in deciduous forests, boreal forests, anywhere there's nice moist forests. So uh, again, group by group is very different. Um, flower flies are pollinators, so they're rather passive to, to watch and collect. Uh, many of them are just visiting flowers. Uh, yesterday though, I was climbing and I got to the top of the trail where there's a bit of a hill and there are a bunch of males uh, aggregating there and it was clearly a, a pickup spot so they're waiting there for females and uh, that's pretty typical of, of any any flies that have mobile food resources and they can't uh, pin down a spot where it's easy to find a mate um, they'll go to hilltops, treetops, isolated trees uh, spots over trails and they'll just hover there. Anyway, so that, that's, that's kind of neat with the surfids. Um, the canopids are a lot of fun. These, these stylogaster, the ones that follow the army ants. We spent five hours today following army ants. Got to wear rubber boots because uh, uh, the army ants will chew you apart otherwise. And they don't seem to climb rubber boots very readily. So, uh, so you stand right in the middle of the ant swarm. And right at the front where all the ants are attacking anything they can find, you'll find lots and lots of flies. And so they're tachinid flies, uh, I guess people call them bristle flies as well. But tachinidae, there's one genus Calodexia that specializes at the army ant front, as does this one canopid, stylogaster. And uh, when the ants disturb a grasshopper or a cockroach, it tears out away from the ants to escape. And all these flies descend at once. It looks like about 50 hawks going after this poor thing at one time. And, and you end up with tachinid eggs and, and stylogaster eggs and all these things in, inside these uh, poor cockroaches and grasshoppers and crickets. And uh, that seems to, I, um, we don't know for sure if the stylogaster are obligate army ant followers, some of them. It's possible that they can't exist otherwise, but we do find them away from ants as well. But perhaps not all species, we just don't know enough yet. So it's quite fun to collect them, it's very active, quite different than collecting Serpidae or Papinculidae. Well, it depends, uh, depends on the group and your perspective. For me, as a, as a naturalist, uh, I'm interested in knowing more about the world's diversity. I simply uh, think it's important to us to know what's out there. And so um, that's a, one of the things that drives me, is simply trying to discover and learn more about a site and, and the, the species of flies that occur there. Uh, from an economic perspective, for those interested, uh, Surfidae are major pollinators. And uh, uh, as we're experiencing bee collapses and things throughout different parts of the world, uh, we have to look to uh, our other major pollinator groups, flies are amongst them. Uh, so so uh, knowing what your surfidae are and what they're doing is, is going to be very important in the future in terms of uh, managing pollinators. And, and already we know that we have to do better at managing hedgerows and things to increase pollinator loads around crops. Um, Big-headed flies, Pipenculidae, are parasitoids of leaf hoppers, plant hoppers, spittle bugs, and uh, not too many of those things are pests. And it's because of big-headed flies are one of the primary parasitoids of those groups. So the females catch a leaf hopper and jab a sickle-like ovipositor into them. Not always sickle-shaped, sometimes straight, and uh, deposit a single egg. The larva develops and kills the host just before they emerge, and uh, they keep the populations of all these uh, plant feeding insects, spittle bugs, leaf hoppers, and relatives under control. Um, the, uh, there are a few pests that uh, of leaf hoppers and plant hoppers, and, and sometimes big headed flies have been attempted to be used for biological control, so introducing them to a new area where they're not found to attack a, um, a pest. Um, Canopidae little different. There are fewer species of them. There's only 800 species of canopids and uh, the uh, the ones that are on flowers are not hugely important as pollinators probably because they're not super abundant. They're probably more important in a negative effect in that they're parasito parasitoids of bees and wasps. And uh, so other than these army ant followers, the rest of the canopidae in the world are attacking bees and wasps and, uh, and laying eggs in those, killing them and uh, sometimes they've been implicated with affecting honeybee numbers and things like that. So uh, we don't really know yet how important they are in terms of their impact on bee pollinators, but uh, 
there, there may be uh, some important linkages there.